Hey guys, I think uh, you all watched the, the video, I'm not sure. Um, what's your feedback? What would you like us to talk about? The Q&A questions are not yet uh, on the dashboard, so we can talk about whatever topic or subject you want to talk about. Okay. So apparently people saw the video. Uh, Yes, sure. Uh, so, um, thank you for joining in. Uh, I'll be answering Anthony's question. He asked about, like, uh, should I take information about my job? Um, it's mostly about uh, my legal position in the company is the general manager. So I don't have any of the departments. So I don't do a lot of uh, work on the ground, but I do mostly coordination between the different departments we have. Uh, around 50% of my time is handling uh, current operations. So the collection schemes, the distribution, the tailoring facilities, the shops, the warehousing, the uh, construction sites that we operate. Uh, and 50% of the time is for um, yani focusing on projects uh, for the future of Fabricate. So hello, our major projects uh, are opening up in Jordan and in Egypt. So uh, working with the investors, uh, procuring the warehouses, the, the land, the, uh, the shops over there, the servers, the uh, starting uh, recruiting the team. Uh, also, we have another scheme and another initiative that we are planning to do in, uh, in UAE. Um, and also there's a recycling initiative, uh, actual recycling, mesh upcycling. Uh, so we'll be uh, getting machines, transferring uh, clothes into fabrics. Uh, and this is one of the projects that I'm heavily involved in. So mostly it's 50-50%, uh, 50 current operations and 50 future operations and future ambitions. Um, another question. I remember you from Jazz. Marhaba, Nabil, if I saw your picture, I would have... Uh, uh, I would have said um, something nice. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm checking other questions. Okay. Um, uh, so how can the startups face the current economic situations uh, that are that are here in Lebanon? Currently, uh, there's a silver lining in what's happening in Lebanon. I know it, the situation seems to be dark, uh, but I'll give you a, an example about why it's the right time to access and to talk to and to get uh, Lebanese investors. It's a great timing to get in Lebanese angel investors. The value of the USD uh, bank accounts has, of course, deteriorated because uh, there's, uh, uh, you, ca you can't access your money. So people who have an abundant wealth are trying to find out ways to take their money outside of Lebanon. And I'll give you a, a personal example that happened with Fabricate. One of the early, early investors at Fabricate, or one of the small angel investors at Fabricate, invested in January 2020, uh, sorry, 2019, $20,000 in Fabricate. Uh, when when she when she invested this amount, I wasn't very sure why did she invest and uh, and I thought that she she was only interested in the initiative. Um, she wasn't interested in any board member position. She wasn't interested in investing process. She was only interested in in investing twenty thousand dollars. Of course, I said yes. So we took the money. We gave her around one point eight percent. The one point eight percent is now around one point six percent, and those one point six percent are currently worth $50,000. So imagine if she kept the $20,000 in Lebanese banks, that her money would have deteriorated in value. Uh, on the other hand, when she invested them in a startup, her money doubled, uh, doubled more than doubled, doubled 2.5 times. Uh, and a lot of investors and a lot of Lebanese people who have current Lebanese accounts are looking for ways to take their money outside of the banks and invest them in, in a uh, and try to make sure that they reduce their uh, their losses. A great way to do that is to invest them to transfer them from your personal bank account to a startup bank account, and this way uh, you can you can definitely reduce your your losses due to the Lebanese banking situation. And this is not the first time it happened. It happened in Argentina before. It happened in uh, in Greece before. And you see every time such a situation happen, 
early stage startups are the one benefit are the ones benefiting the most. Yes, there's no national accelerators because there are there's no funding, and there's no loans from banks. But seed stage startups are not seeking loans from banks anyway. This uh, whatever is happening right now in Lebanon has disastrous effects on large scale corporates. But on seed start seed stage startups, this is the right uh, the right time to involve and to approach. Uh, angel investors who you know that have uh, USD currency uh, savings in Lebanese banks. They would love to take it out of the banks and do it in something that may have an opportunity to increase the value of the money. And a startup is basically one of the few ways uh, where you can currently do that. So um, for an early age age startup, I would definitely recommend uh, trying to approach as many angel investors as possible. Uh, This is the right time to do it. And if you approached them in 2018 and 2017, your success rate would have been very low compared to now. So this is the silver lining. That's what I would advise. Go and speak with angel investors. Do you think COVID-19 will affect small businesses? Uh, Of course. Of course, uh, small businesses are the most effective, especially if they can't adapt and uh, and work um, through an e-commerce platform or online or through delivery. Uh, but this is this is not the case for a startup. For a startup, Susan, if it's a seed stage startup, which I think most of you guys are, I think this is the right time to. Uh, to work on the interior processes, to invest time in the strategy, in the validation, in, in the education, in setting the business plans and the financial models. Usually, it's extremely important to do this. But when the startup is, is starting up, they are rushed and they take crash decisions in creating their business model and taking their financial uh, and creating their financial instruments and their internal bylaws and their financial model, most importantly. Uh, but now, the world is nearly on a pause. So you have time to to zone back, sit in your office, sit in your house with a couple of people through Zoom or Skype, your initial co-founders, and think deeply without being afraid that time is passing you. Time is nearly uh, idle right now. So that's the right time to think. And for a seed startup, that's the right time to set a strategy. Um, um, so uh, some uh, Nina said, but your cost also increase equivalent to the inflation that you're uh, f- uh, equivalent. Okay, okay. Yeah, the costs of everything increase. But again, as a seed startup, your 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 co- your cost shouldn't be much. Uh, we are not investing in heavy infrastructure right now. The things that had a, a huge spike in their and their prices are construction material, um, food and beverage, but. Um, Right now, if you are a tech startup and you want to work with uh, uh, Amazon or uh, all the e-commerce platforms, my Microsoft, my Dynamics, my SAP, all those in, uh, tech platforms that allow you to create your website, uh, your website and your e-platform, they are giving insane discounts. Um, so yes, there is an inflation. Uh, and you take the leader with a 50% inflation, unfortunately, but the vast majority of tech companies that allow you to scale up your startup and to begin your so- to create your social platforms have done far more than 50% discounts. Most of them, of course, not all, but most. Airtable, Asana, uh, Google Drive are all examples of companies that, div- that are giving currently massive discounts, especially for startups. Um, make money and be successful. Of course, of course. Uh, this goes back to the to the idea of this is the right time to to uh, to invest more in strategy. Uh, okay. But if your okay, if your question is about what how how can you generate income through the current situation, um, it's basically through turning your. I'll, I'll give you an example that we are currently embarking on a fabricate. Uh, so the, can, the country went into a complete shutdown, I think, on the 15th of October. Uh, we had a vintage shop that was supposed to open on the 19th of October. Uh, and we, we, we never had the idea of having an online shop to sell the vintage item. We need to generate money, and we need to make sure that there's money always entering to the company, especially when you have high bearing rate time. Well, we have 25 employees or on the payroll even during the quarantine. So the, we need to make some cash. So 
uh, we invested all our skills and all our um, uh, our time in creating this web platform, and we created an a full um, e-commerce platform. We, we made a photo shoot of over, I think, 1,000 vintage items. They are currently on the platform, and the platform will be out next Monday. Uh, and this platform immediately, we have we have investors. Uh, they were in, interested to double on the on their investments. If we if we get initial uh, um, initial traction, we have a set of targets. If we get this uh, those targets, they are they are they've promised to to double on on their investments. Uh, so definitely, this is this is interesting for us. So now we have even more motives to to make this e-commerce platform work. Uh, I hope you will check it out next Monday. My advice is definitely uh, whatever physical activities you have, whether it was retail, whether it is um, um, any any business that requires point of contact, make sure to to translate it online. And I think the vast majority of the, you can do this to the vast vast majority of businesses, even for us as a like the, the the thing of having a vintage shop is the experience of going into the shop, of seeing the items, the way they are displayed. Uh, so of course it makes much more sense to have a physical shop, uh, but there's there's nothing else we can do. And just now we've been working on this for less than a month. But just through working on it for 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 a month, we found out that there's far more opportunities of having an e-commerce platform. And now we are not only selling on this platform and we are doing those deals briefly, we are not only selling uh, our our vintage items, we are only also selling uh, it vintage items from Europe. So we are working with textile reclaimers in Europe. And this wasn't even our business plan. We never thought of this. But now, during, due to the quarantine, um, we had the opportunity to think of this idea, to contact some people in Europe, and they were excited. So we are developing also a tech system that can allow them to, to upload their items on our platform, um, which is something that we didn't think of. And now thinking of it, instead of having a couple of thousand items on the on the website and reaching a small market segment, which is just the Lebanese and the uh, uh, Levant clientele, now we can reach a much bigger item. And now we are talking about, like we uploaded a thousand items, but our partners are uploading th several tenths of thousands of items. Not next week, but in the upcoming weeks. So the platform is going to be much bigger than we expected it to be. And this was an opportunity only because of the quarantine. Okay, it's very hard. Okay. Okay, I'm trying to check more questions. I'm sure I'm sure other uh, other platforms have more questions. Um okay. Um, so one of the uh, one of the things I saw is about the uh, um, so about the advice. Um, I I went into this topic more uh, in more details through a TED talk that I gave back in Libya in 2018. I think um, this talks about the five things I think are most important for uh, siege stage entrepreneurs. Uh, I will go over them really fast right now. The first is Jud bin Maujud. Like try to start from whatever you have. Currently, the vast majority of the Lebanese population do not have, uh, doesn't have capital uh, that, that that they can that they can use to start their businesses. And this was the case for us back in 2017. We did, we had zero funds to start Fabricate, and I think this was a blessing. Because when you don't have funds, you start thinking in a creative way. How can you cut costs and you hear this a lot in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Like, I have an idea and I want the investment. And if I have the investment, I can start implementing uh, and, and reaching validations and reaching metrics. This is useless. Of course, don't use this. Like, don't follow this, uh, this ideology. What I strongly propose is, uh, and if I'm an investor, I would never invest in a startup that uh, has no milestones. What you, what you need to show the investor is that out of no resources, you were able to generate uh, income and revenues. For us, uh, Fabricate is a business that requires uh, a lot of real estate. So we need a sorting facility, we need trucks, we need uh, logistical systems, we need sorting staff, we need uh, retail shops with a lot of decoration. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars. I want to do that. As we planned, we need to have a warehouse and all of those things. That's literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. When we started Fabricate, of course, we couldn't afford something like that. So we, we, instead of doing permanent shops, we did pop-up shops. So in the pop-up shops, the municipality, they gave us the land for free. Uh, we worked 
through our course and through volunteering and through WhatsApp broadcasts, we collected a couple of thousand kilograms of clothes. We sorted them in our houses. We cleaned them in our houses. And we went into the, the first pop-up market. The, the land was given for us by, for free by a municipality. Uh, the marketing, we did the marketing with a local grassroots organization in the area. Hundred people came to the pop-up market. We did a substantial amount of, uh, substantial amount of money all through... Um, all through basically the uh, an activity that literally cost us nothing, like the, only the gas of our cars, our time, uh, and uh, and maybe phone bills. But our time was basically worthless at the time because we had nothing else to do. So uh, you, you don't need money to start an enterprise. And if you think that the only prop, that the only thing stopping you from starting uh, from from working is is capital, I strongly encourage you to reassess your position. This is never that the, the, the case. You can always start without money. And then when you reach traction, money will come, I don't want to say by itself, but money will come much more easier. Um, the second uh, advice I would say I, I have um, is about knocking as many doors as possible. Uh, when we started Fabricate, I was 20 years old, and my co I sent this in the video. My co-founder was 18. Uh, we are from middle-class families. We didn't go into like the most prestigious universities. Um, we literally had no idea how to start a business, and I think this was a big advantage for us. Uh, when, when whenever we were in a room, we felt, and we were truly were. It was true. We were the dumbest people in the room. We were the people with the least experience, and we knew this, and this made us modest. And I think modesty for a seed style, for any entrepreneur, for any human being is very important. But especially for a seed entrepreneur, it's extremely important. Because when you know that you don't have enough skills and you don't have enough experience, but you have the passion and you want to achieve what you want to achieve, you look for advisors and you look for mentors and you look and you ask questions and you show your vulnerability, but you show a sincere devotion to solve the problem. And this is what we did. Uh, we, when we started talking with accelerators and in competitions and with angel investors and with the general advisors and consultants, we made it very clear that the only thing we knew is how big this problem is. But we had no idea how to solve it. We just had a couple of hypotheses. So in creating the solution, we engage as many people as possible. And, through, and when people feel that they are engaged in your solution. They are engaged in, in their work, in your work. They will, they will be emotionally invested in your startup. And, someone, and sometimes emotional investment is far more important uh, than actual capital investment, especially to people with abundant wealth. Uh, so make sure to emotionally make people invest in your own, uh, in your own initiative. And you can do this through asking, question, uh, asking questions, reaching out to people, and... Uh, thanking them and showing gratitude as much as possible. Even when you are helping someone, even when you are giving advice, every single, that's at least what, what I believe in, every single human act, come, even if you are saving children, comes from an individualistic, uh, because of an individualistic desire. And of course, people who are trying to help and are trying to give advice have a lot of... Uh, pureness in their heart, but they also they are also doing this for individual reasons. And they want gratitude, and they want to transcend society, and they want to feel that they have value, and their ideas are valued. Uh, and you can easily help in that. You don't need money to give the people a, a sense of worth. You can do it through showing gratitude and sh through showing them gratitude in front of other people, especially if the other people were their peers, their family, their colleagues, um, their cohorts. Um, so advice number two is try to ask questions and show gratitude after asking the questions. Um, uh, number three, I would, I would, I would strongly encourage startups to, uh, not to use Google as much as possible and not to, use, I've just, I'm, I'm now a bit contradicting myself. I definitely encourage you to talk to consultants and to talk to people uh, with knowledge and experience. But the most important people that you need to listen to are the people suffering from the problem that you are trying to solve. Every single company in the world is trying to, every single successful company in the world, startup is trying to solve a problem. In our case, our problem was trying to solve the, the infrastructure that connects 
the donor with the recipient. And the person who is suffering the most from our uh, 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 from this situation is not the donor. The donor doesn't uh, can sleep uh, at night, and it doesn't. It's not their top priority to need clothes. But the people suffering the most from this situation is, are the vulnerable communities. And in fabricate uh, situation to understand what's happening, and I've never shopped for secondhand clothes. I, I never donated clothes. Uh, I never donated secondhand clothes. I have zero interest in the fashion industry. Uh, I'm more than willing to wear the same T-shirt for an extended amount of time. I have no interest in any of, in any of this, and I have no knowledge. And also my co-founder. So we, we didn't know where to get the information. So we went to uh, an area in Tripoli that has an abundance of secondhand shops. We took clothes with us, and we set up camp over there. We worked with one of the shops in Tripoli. Uh, they gave us the space. We brought the clothes, we sold the clothes, and we gave them 100% of the revenues. Our goal at the time wasn't to make any money. Our goal was to understand the market. And this is very important. We wanted to see uh, who are the people who come to those secondhand shops, how much do they pay, why do they visit, visit those secondhand shops, who buys at the secondhand shop, is it the woman, is it the man, how long do they stay, what are the items are they looking for, what's their average purchasing power, what nationalities go into the, those secondhand shops, or, or is it the underprivileged Lebanese, Syrian or Palestinian, uh, why do they go to those secondhand shops, why don't they go, don't they go to, uh, to the shops in Hamra or the Marlies or the Zal'a, uh, why don't they go to Aldo? Heck, I don't know if Aldo is the. I, I don't know what I said. I don't know if Aldo is the cheap. Uh, yeah, Aldo, yeah, Aldo, Rado. I, one of those two is is very cheap, and I, I was wondering why do they don't they go there? And we discovered that their purchasing power is way less than those places, and they simply can't afford it. And another question we had in mind: Why don't they approach NGOs and why don't they take clothes from NGOs? And then we discovered the problems that are in the NGO system. We would have never guessed those issues without actually going on ground and asking people and working in those in those areas. We, we would have never learned any valuable information. So those are the three major advice. Uh, I'm going to check for other questions. Um, Muhammad Kawtharani, uh, we can take advantage of today's circumstances to actually make money. Okay, I'll answer this question. Um, okay, I'm checking other hands. Okay, um, so one uh, another uh, one another uh, thing that I would I would encourage you to to uh, uh, to, to focus on is the way um, you start the enterprise and the you, the people you engage with it. Uh, in my case, uh, I was the first person who started Fabricate. Uh, and I thought at the time that I can start Fabricate alone and I don't need um, like help or support. Like, you know, I'm, 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 I think I'm, I'm doing what needs to be done. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I think we need to end the live. Uh, so sorry. Uh, uh, um, I, I can't answer any more questions, but please reach out uh, through the Fabricate phone number. My email, omar at fabricate.me. Um, I'll definitely answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. And I hope